We are just one week away from beginning our 24th year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is a QST with the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1247 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Mystery antennas are appearing in the mountains of Utah. Winter Field Day 2023 is coming up. We will have all the details for you. AMSAT announces that Falcon Sat 3 is nearing re-entry. The Radio Society of Great Britain wants photos of your shack and is announcing a new display at the Radio Center in Bletchley Park, UK. Two ham radio bills introduced in Congress have died without action. Radio Relay International extends its digital network into Puerto Rico. The World Radio Sport Team Championship Sanctioning Committee is accepting proposals for the 2026 event. COVID-19 continues to take its toll on the amateur radio community. A recently held Sacramento County Aries drill turns out to happen in real life. We will have an update on the Beauvais Island D expedition and NASA is looking for help from the amateur radio and citizen science community, and you won't need a telescope. We will tell you how to apply in this week's expanded report. These headline stories will be coming up in just a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, returns to answer the question, how much energy does it take to perform a single Google search? And he will talk about how pervasive the internet has become in our lifetime. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will take a look at what you should be learning. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back to the beginning of the technician class license and how early technicians were ostracized from the ham radio community until they were given full recognition as true amateurs. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will take a look at what maintenance you should be doing to your tower and antenna system as we begin the new year. We will have the 2022 year-end Parks on the Air wrap-up with Matt here and 3MWV. We will be taking a look at the pervasive Russian woodpecker, the over-the-horizon radar that swept through the HF bands during the late 70s and middle 80s. That and a lot more is all straight ahead as this special expanded edition of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in the snowy suburbs of Albany, New York, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from the western Catskills of upstate New York, where mud season has arrived two months early, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. What do you call it when computer science majors make fun of each other? Cyber Boolean. Reporting to you from just outside the capital of Albany in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where we've been getting a wintry mix of just about everything, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where winter is still teasing us, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, in an odd series of events that have been making news in recent days, authorities near Salt Lake City, Utah, have been reporting the discovery of unusual antenna arrays along mountaintops and ridges. Officials in Utah say the first antennas actually began appearing more than a year ago. However, an increasing number of the devices have appeared within the last few months, according to Salt Lake Recreational Trails Manager Tyler Fanaro in a statement given to KSL-TV5 earlier this month. 
With little information about who placed the devices on public lands and for what purpose, officials have faced the cumbersome task of having to hike into Utah's snowy foothills to remove the devices. Presently, the reason for the sudden strange appearance of these antennas remains a mystery, although at least a few ideas about the devices have been put forward. Based on images posted to social media, the primary components of the devices consist of an antenna, a router, a solar panel, and a sealed battery container. Although Salt Lake City's Department of Public Lands has been tasked with the removal of many of the devices, some have also appeared on the U.S. Forest Service property as well as land owned by the University of Utah. So, what are the devices and what are they actually being used for? A number of ideas have been put forward, ranging from amateur radio emergency data network units to regional deployments of MODIS wildlife tracking systems. However, in either case, permits should be able to be easily located to confirm this, in addition to available information online that would indicate the deployment of things like wildlife tracking systems, none of which have been found. Another possibility involves the potential use of the antennas as Wi-Fi repeaters. Although with the availability of satellite internet for customers in such remote areas, the illegal placement of antennas on public lands for such purposes again seems less likely. Presently, none of these theories have been confirmed, although in an email, Luke Allen with Salt Lake City's Department of Public Lands was clear about what his agency plans to do with them. Our main priority right now is to get them off the mountain, Allen said. Winter Field Day, sponsored by Winter Field Day Association, is coming soon. This year, the dates are January 28th and 29th. John Ross, KD8IDJ, reports. Radio clubs around the country are activating for this event. Winter Field Day is a communications exercise and is held annually on the last full weekend in January. It can be worked from the comfort of your home or in a remote location. You can participate by yourself or get your friends, family, or the whole club involved. WFD is open to participants worldwide. Amateur radio operators may use frequencies on the HF, VHF, or UHF bands and are free to use any mode that can faithfully transmit the required exchange intact. Like the ARRL Field Day, bonus points are earned in several ways, including using non-commercial power sources, operating from remote locations, making satellite contacts, and more. Complete rules can be found on the WFD website at home-winterfieldday. So that's Winter Field Day, and that's January 28th and 29th. Also, don't forget to mark your calendar for the 2023 ARRL Field Day. That's June 24th and 25th, 2023. Combining these with ARRL's year-long event, Volunteers on the Air, is a great way to make contacts that count for both activities and get new operators on the air. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. You may be surprised to know it's an activity that dates back to 2007. That year, a group of Texas hams came up with a plan to stir up some activity on the band during the winter while challenging operators to set up stations similar to those activated for ARRL's field day in June. A loosely knit group calling itself the Society for the Preservation of Amateur Radio was behind the first few winter field day events. But a small group of members quickly realized they needed some help and handed over the activity on 2015 to the newly formed Winter Field Day Association. That group set up some basic rules and categories that have led to a blizzard of competition that has spread across the U.S. The Winter Field Day Association's mission is simple. It believes hams should practice portable emergency communications in winter environments because of the special challenges presented by freezing temperatures, snow, ice, and other hazards. Last year, more than 2,500 logs were submitted. This year, the 16th year for the event, the organizers are hoping for at least that and more. The Winter Field Day Association passionately believes that ham radio operators should practice portable emergency communication in winter environments, as the potential for freezing temperatures, snow and ice and other hazards presents unique operational concern. Winter Field Day is formatted to help increase your level of preparedness for disasters and improve your operational skills with subpar conditions. You can find more details on the internet at winterfieldday, all one word, dot com. Many amateur radio operators and satellite watchers have been predicting the date and time of re-entry for FalconSat 3. While all re-entry predictions are something of a guessing game due to the large number of variables affecting the upper atmosphere, it is certain that the end for FS3 will be coming very soon. Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation board member and FS3 control operator Mark Hammond, N8MH, said he will try to have the satellite operational for its final hours. The satellite has only been available for approximately 24 hours each weekend due to weak batteries. 
FalconSat 3 was built in 2005 and 2006 by cadets and faculty in the Space Systems Research Center at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. It is the fourth in a series of small satellites designed, built, and operated there as part of a capstone course, which brings together about 30 cadets each year from several different academic departments. Nearly 700 cadets at the U.S. Air Force Academy obtained their amateur radio licenses as part of training to operate FalconSat-3 and other satellites. They have taken that knowledge, understanding, and value of amateur radio into their Air Force service and industry. Since FalconSat-3, the U.S. Air Force Academy Astronautics Department has built and operated one additional satellite and has two more queued for launch. The space operations curriculum and the ground station are being rebuilt and configured for these new space assets. Since its launch on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral in March 2007, the satellite has been through three mission phases. The first phase was operation of the science payloads. The second phase was used as a tool for training cadets in the Space Operations Squadron, students in undergraduate space training in California, and graduate students at the Air Force Institute of Technology. The satellite's third phase was an on-orbit resource for amateur radio and amateur satellite services operation managed by AMSAT. For amateur radio service, the downlink is at 435.103 MHz, transmitting 1 watt into a quarter-wave WIP antenna. The uplink is at 145.840 MHz, and the receiving antenna is a quarter-wave WIP antenna on the opposite side of the satellite. All UHF and S-band equipment on National Telecommunications and Information Administration licensed frequencies has been disabled. The VHF receiver is very sensitive. Modulation is 9600 BPS GMSK for the uplink and downlink. The broadcast call sign is PFS3-11 and the BBS call sign is PFS3-12 on Proto APRS via PFS3-1. The core avionics were designed and built by Mark Kanawati, N4TPY, and Dino Lorenzini, KC4YMG, at SpaceQuest, and have performed remarkably well for nearly 16 years in orbit. Jim White, WD0E, was the lead engineer for FalconSat 3 at USAFA and managed the design, construction, testing, and early operations of the satellite. The success of FalconSat 3 is an excellent example of how amateur radio can be integrated into the curriculum of an education institution for the benefit of the students and the amateur radio service. The Radio Society of Great Britain National Radio Center at Bletchley Park is looking to create a new wall display illustrating some simple radio setups to inspire newcomers to get started in amateur radio. If you would like to have a photo of your radio shack on display, please send in a good quality image showing you operating your radio or of your radio bench. The radio shack could be located anywhere from your loft to your back bedroom garden shed, in your car, or on a mountaintop. Remember, the point of this project is to inspire people to get started in the hobby, so the photos need to show a diverse mix of operators and the radio setup shouldn't be overly complex. The most suitable photos will be selected and a montage display created, with the title, Take a Look at My Radio Station. If you would like to enter, send your photos to NRC dot support at rsgb dot org dot uk again that's nrc dot support at rsgb dot org dot uk meanwhile after several months in restoration and development a wheatstone tape perforator 
and Wheatstone High Speed Morse Transmitter have gone on display in the RSGB National Radio Center at Bletchley Park. Used extensively from the 1940s until at least the late 1960s, such systems enabled the transmission of Morse signals either via telegraph or by wireless at consistently high speeds, without errors such as that might have been introduced by hand-sent Morse. The display is connected to an audio oscillator, so with a push button on the outside of the display case, visitors are able to start the transmitter, see the paper tape being read, and hear Morse characters being sent. Two bills aimed at helping hams were introduced in the waning days of the 117th Congress. The ARRL reported that H.R. 9670, introduced by Ohio Representative Bill Johnson, would preempt most antenna restrictions imposed by homeowners associations. And H.R. 9664, introduced by Arizona Representative Debbie Lesko, would instruct the FCC to replace symbol rate limits in HF amateur radio communications with bandwidth limits, a topic on which the ARRL has had a rulemaking request pending for several years without commission action. Homeowner association and tenor restrictions, of course, have been the subject of ARRL lobbying efforts over several decades. As both bills were introduced in the final days of the 2021-22 Congressional session, they died without action at the end of the year. As we come to air in mid-January, it was unclear if either bill had been reintroduced or whether the sponsors had any plans to reintroduce them. Radio Relay International, an independent amateur radio messaging organization, has expanded its digital traffic network infrastructure to Puerto Rico. According to the organization, the digital traffic network is a hybrid mesh network utilizing HF for long-haul traffic and VHF UHF gateways for local emergency communications activities. Over the past year, according to Radio Relay International, the group has been providing training to volunteers in Puerto Rico, as well as technical support and one-on-one -on -one assistance. During Hurricane Maria, it says, one Radio Relay International volunteer alone handled over 2,000 welfare messages out of the stricken area. The system has the advantage of universal interoperability between voice and CW and digital platforms. Radio Relay International handles traffic as radiograms in voice, CW, and digital modes via the digital traffic station function. Message traffic can also be routed between WinLink and Radio Relay International's own system. Radio Relay International also sponsors the National SOS Radio Network and Neighborhood Radio Watch programs. Puerto Rico now becomes part of a larger surface of RRI's digital traffic network connections that also include Asia, Oceania, and Europe. While much of the amateur radio world awaits the start of the World Radio Sport Team Championship in Bologna, Italy this coming July, the WRTC Sanctioning Committee is already looking forward to hearing from prospective host sites for this prestigious event to be held in 2026. WRTC is an on-site amateur radio competition, usually held every four years. The 2022 event was delayed due to the worldwide public health challenges and government responses to the COVID-19 pandemic and is now scheduled to be held in Bologna, Italy in July 2023. Groups interested in hosting WRTC 2026 should submit a letter of intent with a summary proposal. This should include the following items. Committee organization, identifying each of the principles involved and any relevant organizational and amateur radio experience, especially in contesting slash radio sport. Competition description including plan number of teams, geographic location of operating sites, and competitor selection process. Social aspects, including approximate schedule, travel, and housing arrangements for participants. Financing, including an outline of the budget and fundraising approach. A detailed budget is not required at this time. Expected assistance and involvement from local and regional amateur radio organizations and regulatory authorities. Public exposure, including plans to publicize and promote the event locally and worldwide. The deadline to submit letters of intent is March 31st. Send details directly to Tina Bronyuk, Sierra 50 Alpha, by email. The address is tina.bronyuk at gmail.com. That's T-I-N-E dot B-R-A-J-N-I-K at gmail.com. That address again, T-I-N-E dot B-R-A-J-N-I-K at gmail.com. The WRTC Sanctioning Committee will review all proposals received and respond by April 30th, 2023. 
The committee hopes to announce the venue for the 2026 event at the conclusion of the competition in Bologna. Just a month ahead of its big event in Florida, the Orlando Hamcation has announced the 2023 Hamcation Award winners. Ken Lyons, KN4MDJ, and Jim Storms, AB8YK, are the 2023 recipients of the Carol Perry Educator of the Year Award. The award is given to individuals who have made outstanding contributions to educating and advancing youth in amateur radio. It was first awarded at Hamcation 2019 to its namesake, Carol Perry, WB2MGP, in honor of her work as an educator teaching students about ham radio. Lyons is an ARRL Southeastern Division Assistant Director for Radio Scouting and is the trustee of WB4SA, the Central Florida Council's radio scouting program, for activities and opportunities in both the Boy Scout and Girl Scout programs covered by Division II. The program includes 30,000 scouts in nine counties. Lyons has been licensed since 2018 and now holds an amateur extra class license. On receiving his award, Lyons said, I was not expecting the award, but I'm honored to receive it. Storms is a co-founder and a current team leader for the Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure. He co-founded the Youth DX Adventure in 2010 with Dave Coulter, KB8OCP, now Silent Key. He has been licensed since 2007 and holds an amateur extra class license. He's also an ARRL member and general chairman of 2023 Dayton Hamvention. John Bigley, N7UR, is the 2023 Hamcation recipient of the Gordon West Ambassador of the Year Award. This is the first time the award's been presented. The award honors its namesake, Gordon West, WB6NOA, in honor of his contributions and inspirations to the amateur radio community. Bigley is the ARRL Nevada Section Manager and was chosen as the 2014 ARRL Pacific Division Ham of the Year. He has been licensed since 2003 and holds an amateur extra class license. Bigley's reaction to receiving the award was... surprised? Absolutely. Orlando Hamcation has been sponsored by the Orlando Amateur Radio Club since 1946 and is held annually on the second weekend in February. Hamcation has grown to become the second largest ham fest in the world. 2023 Hamcation is February 10th through the 12th and will host the ARRL Southeastern Division Convention at the Central Florida Fairgrounds and Expo Park in Orlando. Visit hamcation.com for more information. That's hamcation.com. The North Coast Contesters will hold their 29th annual Dayton Contest Dinner. The dinner will be held at the Hope Hotel, located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, on Saturday night, May 20th, 2023, at 6.30 p.m. Social hour opens at 5.30 p.m. and dinner begins at 6.30. Master of Ceremonies will be John Doerr, K1AR, and the 2023 keynote speaker is Bryant Rascal, KG5HVO. Rascal of Montgomery, Alabama, was the 2018 recipient of the Bill Pasternak Memorial Amateur Radio Young Ham of the Year Award. He's also known as a competitive contester who's able to send CW over 60 words per minute. The 2023 CQ Contest Hall of Fame inductees will also be announced during the 2023 Dayton Contest Dinner. Tickets are now on sale. When Sacramento County Aries was invited to participate in an in-person training exercise last summer, they had no idea that a few months later the drill would play out as a real-life event. Most in-person emergency training had come to a halt nationwide over the past few years due to the pandemic, but Sacramento County emergency managers wanted to return from tabletop scenarios to in-person training with deployed incident command posts. This in-person drill focused on the levee system of the Delta for the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. At one point, there was a simulated communications blackout, and Ares was called in to establish contact between the emergency operations center, command posts, and people in the field using FM and Winlink. Now, fast forward to early January. This time, what was happening was not a training exercise. A winter storm caused by atmospheric rivers, with pounding rain, was wreaking havoc throughout the coastal counties of Central and Southern California. Sacramento County activated and included Aries to assist in reporting flooding of the rivers, particularly in the Delta region. Sacramento County Emergency Coordinator Jay Ballinger, N6SAC, said that 
Thanks to the drill, the familiarity the hams had gained with roads around the river region, as well as with the county emergency management, allowed Ares to effectively deploy and report. The BBC has run programming before that examined Morse code as a form of communication, but this month the broadcast revisited the subject with one ham from the United States who is a leading CW educator. On the afternoon current affairs program called PM on BBC Radio 4, Howard Bernstein, WB2UZE, co-founder of the Long Island CW Club, spoke with presenter Evan Davis about the mode's growing popularity in the United States and people's efforts to learn it. The Long Island CW Club has membership around the world availing themselves of the club's free instruction. Meanwhile, the voice of CW enthusiast Mervyn Foster, G4KLE, can be heard on BBC Three Counties Radio. Mervyn, a volunteer at the National Radio Center, appeared on the breakfast program of Andy Collins on the 13th of January. A lifelong fan of CW, Mervyn told Andy about its resurgence in the UK and its usefulness even outside of amateur radio. A stretch of days with great conditions on 10 meters has provided a bonus for a number of events in the band lately. In Germany, the Dutcher Amateur Radio Club held its 10-meter contest on January 8th, with hams getting on the air using CW and SSB. The Nordic Radio Amateur Union's 10-meter activity contest will be held on February 2nd, with CW operations on the air from 1800 to 1900 UTC, SSB users on the air from 1900 to 2000 UTC, and FM users competing between 2000 and 2100 UTC. Digital competitors getting in on the action from 2100 to 2200 UTC. Just two days later, entrants in this year's 1010 International Winter QSO party will hope to make good use of favorable band conditions for operators using SSB on February 4th and 5th. The nonprofit organization, the 1010 International Net, was created in 1962 to encourage activity on the 10 meter band and promote good operating practices. Here's an update on the upcoming de expedition to Bouvet Island. The latest report from the Bouvet Island de expedition, 3Y0J, is that radio operations could start sometime between the 27th of January and the 4th of February. The team intends to stay on the remote island for three weeks. According to a post on dxworld.net, Kenneth Opsker, LA7GIA, has reported that the sale from Port Stanley began on the 17th of January, just one day behind schedule. The operator said they are not planning any activity on the way, however, you can track them using the Garmin link, share.garmin.com forward slash 3y0j. COVID-19 continues to exact a toll, including the recent passing of two hams who may be familiar to you. Both succumbed to complications of the COVID virus. Longtime CQ Magazine technical illustrator Hal Keith passed away in late December at age 88. You probably never saw his face in the magazine, but his work graced their pages for nearly 50 years. CQ Contest Hall of Famer and longtime member of the CQ Worldwide Contest Committee, Alfred Fred Lund III, K3ZO, became a silent key in early January at age 85. He was also a director of the Yasme Foundation. Fred served for many years in the U.S. Foreign Service at posts around the world, at one time being kidnapped and shot by rebels in Argentina while serving as director of the U.S. Agency for International Development program there. China's new CAS-5A satellite, launched in December and recently designated by AMSAT as Fengtai Oscar 118, or FO-118, includes an FM repeater and two linear transponders. While one transponder uses a common band layout of 2 meters up to 70 meters down, the second has an uplink of 15 meters, 21.427 to 21.442 megahertz, and a downlink on 70 centimeters, 435.498 to 435.512 megahertz. This is the first amateur satellite carrying an HF transponder since the Russian radio Sputnik series in the 80s and 90s. According to the AMSAT News Service, FO-118 was designed, built, and tested by a group of 31 high school students working closely to, with CAMSAT, the Chinese Amateur Satellite Group. 
The satellite also carries CW and GMSK's telemetry beacons. AMSAT UK has a user manual for FO 118 available online at the UK AMSAT website. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Whether you live in the city or out in the country, you probably have found woodpeckers nesting in some of the strangest places, but none so strange as HF receivers. There you'll find woodpeckers that don't sound like any others. Over the horizon, woodpeckers were a real pest in the 80s. Bob Horovitz made a study of these high-tech woodpeckers during the 80s. At the time, Bob was executive secretary for ANARC, the Association of North American Radio Clubs. Rain's founder, Hap Holly, KC9RP, caught up with Bob at the 1988 Dayton Hamvention. Well, the Woodpecker Project was founded in 1984 to band use information about the woodpecker to present at the World Administrative Radio Conference for High Frequency Broadcasting. The second session was held in March of 87. The report was a distillation of monitoring from all around the world. 140-some monitors in 20-some countries tracked the woodpecker for three days in October of 85, and all this information was distilled and presented in a written report to the HF Broadcasting Conference, and it was released at the climax of the conference, I, I have to say, the U.S. delegation was very supportive of the project. The report got an incredible reception among the delegation, and it was introduced uh, to the delegates a day before a provision was adopted in the recommendations of the conference to require the ITU to monitor the HF broadcasting bands to identify the sources of harmful interference. The ITU being? The International Telecommunication Union, the group that sponsored this radio conference. Anyway, the word of that provision to identify sources of harmful interference was broadened specifically to include the woodpecker. It was not just the co-channel interference from one broadcasting station to another, but any intentional harmful interference that was present in the bands. And that was uh, a way of accommodating our interests in the U.S. position. The question of what the woodpecker is is still shrouded in a bit of mystery. The Soviet Union has only said that they are for test purposes and they say that they're for propagation research. Very few people believe that they would spend this kind of money and arouse this kind of wrath and endure the condemnation of countries just to, to gather information about the ionosphere. It is being used occasionally for ionospheric research, but most people that have studied it think it's a radar and that the frequency selection process shows that it's specifically designed for over-the-horizon applications. But beyond that, it's kind of hard to tell what it's designed to detect my own feeling is that it's primarily to detect the naval vessels in the oceans off the coast of Siberia and the North Sea, but there are other people who believe that it's for tracking aircraft, and the Defense Department says that it's for early detection of ICBMs. So there's a wide range of possibilities. Even if you accept the notion that it's a radar, it's still not clear what its purpose is. Why necessarily use HF frequencies for such radar communications? Can't that be done elsewhere? Well, it's true of all over-the-horizon radars that they must use the same features of propagation that allow broadcasters to span oceans for the sake of getting an echo back from over the horizon. If the targets that they were interested in could be detected by a line-of-sight signal, they wouldn't need to use HF, and that's one of the reasons why people assume that the woodpecker is an HF over-the-horizon radar. The problem with that is that all of the HF band except for a few channels for radio astronomy, are really reserved for communications purposes. Radar operates in other parts of the spectrum in exclusive allocations. They don't have to coexist with communications. But that unique property of ionospheric propagation that allows the reach of the signal to go over the horizon the broadcasters use is only found in the bands that are allocated for communications and radars that want that same capability have to use those same channels that are already allocated for communications and it's going to be a growing problem as more nations develop similar systems and more applications of the technology are developed. Now the U.S. has an over-the-horizon radar installation but I understand that is not causing problems with stateside communications. Is it causing problems, do you think, over the pole, the way the woodpecker causes problems over the pole on this side? 
Well, I haven't heard the U.S. system from outside the U.S. I have heard it inside the U.S. It's quite loud, but I must say the Air Force has done an outstanding job of selecting channels that are unoccupied, or at least they sound unoccupied here. And right now, the one sector which is on the air is still testing, and it's not on an operational basis full-time. Where are we talking about frequency-wise? Well, all over. I've heard them primarily in 5 megahertz and 13 megahertz bands. Does it sound just like the woodpecker? No, it doesn't sound at all like the woodpecker. They can change the waveform, and it's hard to characterize the sound. When the bandwidth is wide and the sweep rate is low, it sounds like a chirp. But when they speed it up and narrow the bandwidth, it sounds like a buzz. It's easily detectable if you have your uh, receiver in single sideband mode. The signal itself is an FM modulation, and if you're listening in AM, it's very hard to hear, actually. It's, it's quite a soft sound, and it's very spectrally pure, so that even when it is co-channel with the station, you can generally hear through it much more easily than the woodpecker. The woodpecker is not just loud, but it's orally opaque. Is that because of newer technologies? Yes, they've designed the waveform to minimize interference. The woodpecker was really designed for whatever mission it had without regard to the interference problem. And like I said, the, the Air Force has been very good at selecting frequencies that are unoccupied and at choosing a waveform which is spectrally pure and confined to a fairly small bandwidth. Let's talk about the woodpecker. How is it generated and how does it work when you try to study it? in a spectrum analyzer or on a, a scope of some sort. I wish I knew more about how it was generated. I, I, I must say I'm not familiar with radar technology. When you look at it on a spectrum analyzer or even an oscilloscope, you can see that there's quite a very complicated structure inside that little pulse. It seems to be carrying a phase modulation that produces sharp down spikes, and the purpose of that people that have, have more knowledge about this than I do say that it's to identify which source is being heard in the echo. In other words, the woodpecker is more than one transmitter and more than one antenna, and they get echoes back from different signals that are on the air simultaneously. And in order to know which transmitter is being heard in the echo, each pulse carries a slightly different code on it by phase modulation. And this requires a kind of receiver that is very different from a shortwave communications receiver. You can't hear any difference from one woodpecker pulse to another. But when you see them on an oscilloscope or in a spectrum analyzer, uh, you can actually identify which transmitter is being operated. There's a, a ham operator in England named Peter Martinez who studied the woodpecker signal in great detail. And he has actually identified the codes that are used for the individual transmitters. The woodpecker is obviously a big problem because you now see receivers and transceivers for the amateur as well as non-amateur market that have the so-called woodpecker noise blankers. It's true, and I don't know how effective they are. The woodpecker, as I observe it, often has a, a peculiar a syncopation in its pulse. It, its, its pulse is normally very regular at 10 per second, but every six seconds or so it loses or gains a fraction of a millisecond. And I've talked to a number of people about why that is, and, and the consensus seems to be that uh, it's for calibration purposes. In order to know the exact time delay between the transmitter and the receiver, it's continually recalibrated. There may be other purposes, there may be other interpretations, but that little syncopation suggests to me that you would need a very sophisticated blanker if it's actually tracking the pulses by time, because it would have to have that same syncopation and that would be a very difficult thing to pull off. It would almost have to be detecting the signal and responding immediately to its presence. If it were operating under a separate clock, it would go out of sync every six seconds, in other words. Are you aware of any additional stepped-up activity from the woodpecker? Here in the spring of 88, we've seen more activity from the woodpecker than I've seen in the last few years. Do you think it's just a matter of the sunspot cycle being more favorable now for receiving it? No one really knows how effective the woodpeckers are. My own guess is that they're not very effective, even at their best. Um, certainly the sunspots improving the propagation means that they're probably getting a better echo back, and therefore they might be using it more. I, I think, though, that the real issue isn't so much whether the woodpecker is active or inactive, because it comes and goes at one time or another, 
but that this whole technology is developing and that people are finding new applications and, and new budget money to, to build enormously powerful systems. The U.S. system is just getting underway. The Australian system is getting underway. There will probably be additional systems in England and Japan. The scientific radars are spreading. These are not for air defense, but for atmospheric propagation studies. There are at least a dozen scientific uh, over-the-horizon radars that I know of, and there will probably be 10 or 20 more in the next decade. What are these going to do to both the shortwave and amateur band? That is the issue, isn't it? It is. The issue is, is that there's a finite amount of spectrum, and the radars are generally operating in channels that are allocated to communication services. So it's crucial that there be monitoring by the radars to know whether the channels they're picking are occupied or not. And I'm afraid that in the case of a radar that's relatively low-budget university operation, they may not have the equipment or the skilled personnel or even the interest in trying to minimize interference. A system like the Air Force is building, where they know they're going to be a real problem to other users, they're really taking a great deal of effort to minimize interference. But somebody who's just a, an academic doing ionospheric propagation studies in a place, in, say, in Sweden or France or Canada, may not be so careful. And because they can control their waveform and change it at will, it might be hard for people to identify who is actually causing the interference so that they would know they could get away with it even if they did cause interference. What's the ITU doing about all this? When I was at the administrative radio conference in March of 87, I got a chance to speak with Mr. Bell Chambers, who's the head of the International Frequency Registration Board. They're very aware of the problem. It, it, in general, frequency hopping systems were never contemplated when the ITU set up their band plan, and it is still very difficult for them to get a handle on systems that do not operate within single channels. They're aware of the problem, they're aware that it's growing, and they don't really have the framework to do much about it. And particularly in the case of the ITU, they don't have any police force that goes out to shut down transmitters. They're really depending on the cooperative attitude of the nations that belong to the Union. And in the case of the Soviet Union, we've seen that a nation with an uncooperative attitude can really wreak havoc. Are you optimistic that countries will take a more responsible approach to helping to protect the spectrum, which their own people use to listen to the broadcast? emanating from the same country that may be putting these over-the-horizon signals out. I can't say I'm optimistic about the future. I think that this technology of uh, over-the-horizon radar is uh, fascinating, and it has a lot of scientific value and military value, and that there we're going to see more systems in the future. I think the spectrum is going to be filled with more radars. I just don't know what will happen. There'll be a point of diminishing returns, obviously, where if the interference gets bad for communications, it's going to get just as bad for radars. The thing that concerns me most is that I think people will start to see the meteorological applications of over-the-horizon radar. Uh, that is for predicting weather uh, patterns over the oceans where the coverage of ground stations is lacking. And once meteorological applications take over, I think we're going to see a lot more radars operating around the clock. And that concludes Hap Poly KC9RP's interview with Bob Horowitz at the 1988 Dayton Hamvention. Besides studying the Russian woodpeckers in the mid to late 1980s, Bob was executive secretary for ANARC, the Association of North American Radio Clubs at the time. It should be noted here that these high-tech woodpeckers went the way of the Soviet Union in 1989. The United States has begun work on the deployment of a new long-range, over-the-horizon radar system for the United States Air Force, which will be placed on the Pacific island of Palu. The sensor station, known as the Tactical Mobile Over-the-Horizon Radar, or TACMOR, will be set up on the highly strategic island of Palu. The sensor station intends to improve the situational awareness of U.S. and Allied forces operating in the region in the air and maritime domain. The Department of Defense announced on December 28th that it had granted Gilbane's federal business a $118.4 million contract to develop the structural foundation of a new U.S. Air Force radar station to be built in the Republic of Palau. The Naval Facilities Engineering Systems Command Pacific acts as the contracting activity for what is known as the TACMOR Infrastructure Project. The work is anticipated to be finished by June 2026. 
Over-the-horizon radars are radar systems that can locate highly distant targets beyond the range limit of conventional radars. They operate in the HF frequency band of 5 to 30 megahertz and can detect objects hundreds to thousands of kilometers away. These radars employ powerful radio signals transmitted by a big antenna or an array of antennas. Similarly, using a high-frequency sounder antenna and a backscatter sounder, TACMOR will transmit high-frequency over-the-horizon flight information. The system will also complement another air and maritime domain awareness radar station in Palu, which was announced in 2017. The data gathered by TACMOR will be forwarded to an off-site operations control center via a secure, undisclosed receiver site. Their control center can access real-time target tracking and extraction data to support combatant command tasks. A modern over-the-horizon radar on Palu can support space-based and terrestrial sensor and weapon systems. The system will likely function to cue and provide early warning of approaching ballistic, cruise, and hypersonic weapons, as well as enemy ships and aircraft. In particular, over-the-horizon radar makes it possible to continuously monitor certain areas without deploying numerous types of radar systems over an extensive area at any given time on the ground, in the air, or at sea. The system's development, testing, and acquisition, together with the addition of related components, will give warfighters the capacity to fill in surveillance coverage gaps in crucial Pacific regions of significance to the United States and our allies, the document reads. The long-range radar is another signal of increasing U.S. alertness in the Pacific. All in all, the system could be crucial for monitoring Chinese and North Korea's activities. Earlier this week, the Federal Communications Commission released an order adopting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel's plan to modernize the FCC by establishing a Space Bureau and Office of International Affairs. The planned reorganization will better support the needs of the growing satellite industry, promote long-term technical capacity at the FCC, and help the agency navigate 21st century global communication policy. As part of this plan, the agency will be eliminating the current International Bureau and incorporating the team into the new Bureau and Office. The satellite industry is growing at a record pace, but here on the ground, our regulatory frameworks for licensing have not kept up. We're working to change that. Today, we are moving forward with our plan to prepare for what comes next, said Chairwoman Rosenworcel. A new Space Bureau at the FCC will ensure that the agency's resources are appropriately aligned to fulfill its statutory obligations, improve its coordination across the federal government, and support the 21st century satellite industry. I also thank my fellow commissioners for their support. This week's action is the latest initiative in the FCC's space innovation agenda. As part of this agenda, the FCC has taken action to speed up regulatory review processes, increase the size of the FCC's satellite division by 38%, create new opportunities for competition in the delivery of satellite broadband services, and modernize spectrum policy to better meet the needs of the next generation space age. The Space Bureau will consist of three divisions, the Satellite Programs and Policy Division, the Satellite Licensing Division, and the Earth Station Licensing Division. These new divisions will have responsibilities and authorities for the analysis and functions currently housed within the Satellite Division of the International Bureau including its branches, the Policy Branch, the Engineering Branch, and the Systems Analysis Branch. The Office of International Affairs will consist of the Global Strategy and Negotiation Division and the Telecommunications and Analysis Division. The Global Strategy and Negotiation Division will be moved to the Office of International Affairs from the International Bureau as currently organized, including each of its existing branches, and will maintain its current responsibilities and authorities. Similarly, the Telecommunications and Analysis Division will be moved to the Office of International Affairs from the International Bureau as currently organized and will maintain its current responsibilities and authorities. As the agency promotes space innovation, it also has taken actions to advance space safety and responsibility, including by adopting new rules for deorbiting satellites to address orbital debris risks. The FCC will next seek congressional and other approvals for the planned reorganization and make formal notice in the Federal Register. 
And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I felt, I don't know, what are you, how, how are you feeling these days? I feel, now I'm in an unusual situation because I overshare already. I'm on the air talking to people five days a week, four days a week. So by the time I get home, I feel like anything that anybody wants to know about me is already out there. So I don't use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social networks like that, probably in the way a normal person would to let people know what I'm up to and to promote stuff. Uh, it just, uh, I don't, I don't feel the need. It's the same reason I got my ham license, you know, my amateur radio license. I was very excited. I really enjoyed it. Took the test, got the, the general license and got all the equipment and stuff. And then I never use it because I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm already talking to people <laughs> for my work all day, every day. And the last thing I want to do, I know there are people, I know Art Bell, Art Bell, he'll do his, he used to do his radio show, get off the air and then go on uh, and, and, and talk to hams for two more hours. I just want to go home and watch TV. <laughs> I just want to shut up. It's funny how the internet has just, it's woven into our, the fabric of our lives, isn't it? And it's, uh, it's, it's influence is completely pervasive. It's just in everything we do. And it's so funny how quickly humans are amazingly adaptable. We just take it, take for granted the fact that we have information at our fingertips at all times. It used to be, it would drive me crazy. You know, I, you'd have a fact on the, just right in the tip of your tongue and you just can't quite like the name of the movie with with the uh, julia roberts and uh, richard Gere, and it was a big hit what was the name of that and you can't but you know all you have to do nowadays you pull out your phone you can ask you know who and depending on whose phone you have and you know who will say oh yeah that was a pretty woman and it'll tell you more if you want this used to happen to me all the time or you or you'd say yeah i wonder wonder what the uh, production of uh, steel in metric tons was in the year 1992. What was the U.S. production of steel in metric tons in 1992? And if you wanted to know that in, the, in, a, in back in my day, not even that long ago, 20 years ago, you'd have to go to the library, <laughs> the library, and, and look it up. And it would probably not, you know, it would take some actual skills to find it, wouldn't it? You might have to go to the the reference librarian and ask for her, her help and say, how, how do you know? Nowadays, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to know, it's there. And a lot of stuff you don't want to know, it's, it's right there. What a change. There's another change. There are other changes. Of course, there are a lot of changes that the, the Internet hath wrought and, and computers in general hath wrought. You know, local newspapers kind of dying, local radio stations kind of fallen off the wayside it's just we get everything uh via the internet now we're so dependent on it so dependent on it i read a really interesting piece in the atlantic yesterday used to be a magazine they would print these on dead trees and they'd mail them to you the atlantic is one of the few magazines that's really survived the digital era by, by getting very aggressive in the digital f domain i don't know if they make money i hope the atlantic's doing well article by a guy named Robert Robinson Meyer that I just it kind of resonated with me what the death of iTunes says about our digital habits we have we are a nation of digital hoarders and it really started with Gmail 20 almost 20 years ago when Gmail first came out the whole point of Gmail was you never delete your d mail ever again just keep it all and Google the kings of search will let you search for it boom there it is Everything you've ever talked about, written about, you forgot somebody's address, no problem, search their name, it's there. Years and years and years worth. And don't worry, they even said, don't worry. You'll, unlimited storage, it wasn't. But, you know, virtually unlimited storage. So there's no reason to throw anything out. That's what's changed. There's no reason to throw anything out. Hard drive space is cheap. Look at your phone. This is one of the things Robinson was talking about. He's look at your phone in the old days. When the iPhone first came out, most iPhone users only maybe one or two home screens. Maybe even you put your apps in folders. But with the death of iTunes, you used to be able to drag the apps around. Remember that? But it was kind of a pain when you get a new phone, you have to drag it all around again. <laughs> Nowadays, nobody does that. Well, you tell me. Most iPhone users, he says, could not tell you where the most used apps on their phone live. Because it doesn't matter anymore. 
Don't put your apps in folders. Don't organize them. Download them and search for them because that's the reality of the of the 2000s. You know, you pull down the screen a little bit, you type the first few letters, there's your app. Who knows where it is? It's in there somewhere. Since 2010, the cost of a gigabyte of hard drive space has gone, gone from 10 cents to one cent in 10 years. I just bought a 16 terabyte hard drive for under $400. 16 terabytes is an unimaginable. The entire library of Congress fits in eight. Two libraries of Congress could fit on that one hard drive. And it's $400 of storage. So we now live in this in this world where you just you just keep it all, right? Is that right? Remember, remember uh, this seems so naive, so innocent. The days of the inbox zero. Did you ever hear that phrase, inbox zero? The idea, and I think there's still some people pursuing it. Give it up. It's over. The idea was every day. I shall go into my email inbox and I shall process everything is in there until there are zero emails in my inbox. Do you do that? The only people still doing that are nuts. You want to know how many emails are in my inbox? Let's go check. I don't even look anymore. <laughs> I think it's well over 25,000. Inbox zero? Are you kidding me? In fact, there, people even made up this idea of, call, of declaring email bankruptcy where you would say to people... Um, I give up. I have too many emails. I can't get to you all. I am now at this point, as of today, January 19th, 2020, deleting all my email. If you, if I haven't responded to you, send it again. I'm going to start over. I'm declaring email bankruptcy. Have you heard it? <laughs> this was about the same time as Inbox Zero. No, nobody does that anymore. You just, it's, I, it's, but there's a side effect, right? Because I'll be honest with you. I don't even look at my email anymore. I mean, once in a while, it's always, it's an adventure. I always feel, I got, geez, I got, I, the other, I felt so bad. Old friend, really good friend, long time ago, Paul, I'm so sorry, sent me an email in, I think it was May of last year saying, hey, I need a little uh, help. Could, could you just call me and, and, and give me a little help on the computer thing? Because I have a little question. And he probably thinks I don't like him because I never answered because I never saw it. And now what do you do? It's eight months later. Now what do I do? Do I answer it? What would you do? Would you answer it and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see this. That's kind of sad. That's pathetic. Would you just ignore, continue to ignore it and then let him have the misapprehension that I hate him? Because I don't. I love him. But I, I don't know what to do. All right. I'm sorry. Retro G is correcting me. There's so much hoarding going on at the Library of Congress. It has gone from 8 terabytes to 20 terabytes. So I need to buy two drives and then I'd still have a little leftover. The Library of Congress contains every published work ever in the United States that's ever been published in the United States, and it's 20 terabytes. It's crazy. They're hoarding. <laughs> They're like all of us. I'm just, you know, I bring this up only to say it's okay. Don't feel guilty. You haven't answered that email since May. Your iPhone is completely disorganized. I bet you, you might even be the kind of person who has like a thousand icons right there on the desktop of their computer. Just like... <laughs> I see that and I go, what the? There's some of us that are a little OCD, like we're, we're, we still organize. Give it up. Forget it. It can't happen. It's impossible. How many files are on your computer? I don't think Siri knows the answer to that one, but just look. How many files? It, there are, in all likelihood, many tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds, hundreds of thousands of files on your computer right now, most of which you have no idea what they do. Just leave them. It's fine. You know how much energy a simple Google search uses but we don't think of it we don't really think of that do we i mean we don't we don't go oh wow i gotta cut back on my google <laughs> my googling <laughs> i gotta i gotta i gotta slow down on my googling because it's using up a single according to well the uk's independent fact checking charity fullfact.org a google search and this is google's own estimate a Google search, each and every one, and how many trillions of searches a day, right? Each and every one could power a 10-watt light bulb for 108 seconds. <laughs> Just 108 seconds. So if you see a, you see an overestimate somewhere, that's is Google's own. Mm. That's a 60, uh, equivalent of a 60-watt LED bulb. It's a 10-watt. So an LED bulb for 108 seconds. Okay, you might say, pfft. Okay, that's pretty trivial. It's not, though. Add that up. How many searches a second? 
go through Google. That's the issue. The point I, the only point I'm making here is that we don't think about the cloud using energy, but it does. It uses a ton of energy and we're using it all the time. Every time you go on the net, every website you visit, every search you make, when you go you know, to Google and you type in a search term, it's as if these machines are going, think about what it's got to go through. Billions and billions of bytes of data looking for that one little thing. You know, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? You go, and it's, it spins up energy. And these companies, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, because of this, when they build their big network operation centers, which are just giant buildings, giant tilt-up buildings with thousands of computers inside. They're just little, they're called rack mount because they can, they can, they don't stand on a desk. They sit in a rack and they're lined up. They're rack mount computers, thousands of them, row upon row of blinky lights, all connected by wires. And it's not just the computers. Those things use energy. You know, they heat up. Oh, they heat up. That's another problem. You got to have a lot of air conditioning in there to keep the, I mean, imagine if you put 10,000 computers in a, in a small, you know, in a 10,000 square foot space, how hot it would get in there. So you've got to have giant air conditioning. So a lot of power used up by these network operation centers. And then, and not to mention all the switches and all the networking stuff. And then, you know, you got to pay for that power. So companies tend to build their network operation centers in places where power is cheap and cooling is available, which often means near hydroelectric facilities uh, up in Oregon where it's cooler uh, and, and they have a cheap power. Northern Virginia, for some reason, that's a big, Nova is a big area where a lot of, North Carolina too. It's a, it, so they, they're actually out there trying to find places where we can run these network operation centers cheap. And, and if you think about it, when you do a Google search, it's not just one network operations center. They're all over the place. They're all over the world. In fact, some of these companies have so much computing power on the line that they'll just rent out the excess from time to time. That's how, that's actually how the first online services start. You may remember if you're an old timer. It's funny. I always know when somebody's been computing for a long time, if they're an old timer, if I say, what's your CompuServe ID? And they go, oh, 75106, 3135. That's, that was mine. If you remember your CompuServe. Well, CompuServe came about because H&R Block, the big tax firm, had lots of computers to do taxes, but they noticed they weren't real busy. <laughs> April 16th, it got a little quiet. And they said, we should do something. We've got all these computers. We don't really, can't really shut them down. They're, they're churning along. We should do something. So they started an online service called CompuServe. General Electric did the same thing. They called it Genie. There's no excuse for America Online. That's just, <laughs> that just, that just happened. So this is, the, and that's what Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple uh, all do. They, they lease out computing power. Google has the Google Compute Engine and the Elastic Cloud. Or is that Amazon? I think Amazon's the Elastic Cloud. Uh, they have AWS, Amazon Web Services. Turns out they make more money on AWS than they do on selling stuff to you. Did you know that? Amazon, in order to be Amazon, had to put all these computers together, build these network operations centers. They also had to build uh, fulfillment centers, right? Big warehouses all over the country where your stuff is so that they can ship it out to you. And uh, Jeff Bezos, you don't get to be the richest man in the world without a little bit of smarts, right? He said, hmm. We got all this excess capacity, both in fulfillment centers and in computing. What can we do with it? They created Amazon Web Services, many billions of dollars a year in revenue. It's very profitable for them. For storage, for computing. If you go to a website, most of your websites, most of the places you go are not, you know, if you go to uh, the Washington Post, it's not some computer in Washington, D.C. No, it's an Amazon server, Amazon Web Services server somewhere else. AWS is even my website. If you go to techguylabs.com or our podcast site, twit.tv, those are running on Amazon Web Services. Everybody does. Why would you want to do anything else? Amazon is cheap. It's got all this extra stuff. And then they had all these fulfillment centers. What else did they do? Well, about half of all the stuff you buy from Amazon now isn't from Amazon. You're buying it from a third party that is using Amazon's facilities to store and ship their stuff. It's actually been an amazing success, not just for Amazon, but just for our economy, because it's a lot easier to start a business. Whether you're going to be a, a software startup, a website, maybe you're going to sell stuff out of your house. You don't have to have a fulfillment center. You don't have to have shipping. You just say, okay, Amazon, you handle it. I'll send you the order. You handle it. And you, you make your little 
profit. Some of it goes to Amazon. Same thing with computing. If you're a startup, I don't want to have to run a server. I don't, you know, so you can do it on Amazon or, or, you know, Microsoft does this, Google does this, a lot of companies do it now with their excess server capacity. It's kind of interesting. It's really kind of powered this modern uh, technology age. We don't think about it. It's infrastructure. It's it's the cloud. It's out there. But uh, no, it's the cloud. When you do a Google search, many dozens of computers wake up and say, hello. They pull down enough power to power a 10 watt bulb for 108 seconds. And they give you the answer. And boy, do they give you the answer fast. Think about that. We just take this by, for granted now. But if I type in who won the Super Bowl in 2019, I don't even have to type it. I could just, I can ask Siri, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? Patriots beat the Rams in the Super Bowl by a score of 13 to 3 on February 3rd, 2019. That was less than one second to get that answer. And 108 <laughs> minutes, no, seconds of light bulb power. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? We really take that for granted. There is a whole bunch of stuff, and it's happening invisibly behind the scenes. Pretty cool, I think. We live in interesting times, don't we? Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In our last installment, we saw how, when the FCC created the Technician Class License back in 1951, their intention was to give it a separate and unique purpose. The Commission stated that the Technician Class License was established expressly for serious-minded experimenters who needed spectrum space in which to conduct their tests. It was not established as a communicator service and was not to be a stepping stone between the novice and general class licenses. The original technician class operator only had privileges above 220 megacycles. In 1955, they were given six meters, and in 1959, the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of two meters. Getting additional frequencies for technicians was difficult. The petitions could not mention communications as a reason, but rather had to show that there was a need for additional experimentation on the 6 and 2 meter bands. Because of the experimental nature of the license, technicians were not allowed to become racy stations. They also faced some discrimination by a few higher class amateurs. In fact, several proposals were made to the FCC to punish technician who used the airwaves to communicate rather than to experiment. In 1962, two events occurred. First, the FCC denied petitions to give technicians the 29.5 through 29.7 megacycle segment of 10 meters, as well as full two meter privileges. In rejecting these petitions, the FCC stated there was considerable misunderstanding about the role of the technician class and restated the experimental policy they had issued back in 1951. Also that year, a new amateur publication hit the market, VHF Horizons. Concentrating on six meters and above, this magazine was full of technical articles, construction projects, contest information, and VHF news but it was the editorial content of VHF Horizons that broke new ground. For the first time, an amateur magazine called for a rewrite of FCC policy. They wanted technicians to be considered full-fledged amateurs and not just experimenters. Naturally, this caused controversy in the amateur community. Technicians who considered themselves communicators flocked to this new publication, while some higher class amateurs condemned it and restated their position that communicating technicians were violating FCC policy. Unfortunately, VHF Horizons was not able to turn a profit and expired after only two years. In 1967, the FCC instituted incentive licensing. While the actual frequency lost by technicians was minimal, just the first 100 kilocycle CW segment of six meters, the FCC still struck a blow to those wishing to remove the experimenter status from this license. The FCC once again turned aside requests to expand technician privileges to the full 2 meter band. In addition, the FCC also removed 2 meter voice privileges for novices and took away the right for an amateur to simultaneously hold a novice and technician license. 
According to the commission, too many novices were operating two-meter voice, were not increasing their code speed, and were upgrading only to technician instead of general when their novice license expired. Once again, the 1951 policy was restated. However, despite the FCC's position, thousands of technicians were on the VHF bands as communicators. With the rise of 2-meter FM, new technicians were taken to the airwaves every day, mostly with surplus wideband commercial equipment. Recognizing that the role of this class of license had evolved, the ARRL Board of Directors met on November 1, 1969 and came to a decision. In an editorial in the December 1969 issue of QST entitled, Technicians as Communicators, the ARRL's new position was stated. Technicians were no longer experimenters, but rather full-fledged communicators. The ARRL proposed that they be given the full 2-meter band, the 29.5 to 29.7 megacycle segment of 10 meters, and the ability to once again hold a novice license simultaneously. The ARRL put these proposals before the FCC in a petition. The FCC did not immediately respond to this petition, but rather, in 1971, issued an odd ruling in which they stated that a technician class amateur could not use a repeater in which the input was in the technician subband of 145 through 147 megacycles, but the output was above 147. Nevertheless, since the repeater subband in the early 70s was 146 through 148 megahertz, and the technician was not allowed above 147, the FCC was under pressure. On October 17, 1972, technicians were given the 147 through 148 megahertz segment of 2 meters. The FCC denied technicians 10 meters, novice privileges, and the 144 through 145 megahertz segment of 2 meters, but the door was opened. With thousands of technicians on 2-meter FM, the FCC then moved slowly towards full VHF privileges for them, realizing that the experimental designation was obsolete. In 1975, technicians were given novice frequency privileges. When the new repeater subband was opened at 144.5 through 145.5 MHz, technician privileges were expanded to 144.5 through 148 MHz. The FCC also realized that technicians could no longer be excluded from RACI's operation. In 1976, the FCC eliminated the mail order status of the technician exam and required applicants to show up at an FCC examination point. Finally, in 1978, technicians received full 2-meter privileges. In the eyes of the FCC, they were full-fledged amateurs. In 1987, the exam was made easier by splitting Element 3, the general written exam, into 3A for technician and 3B for general. Also in 1987, technicians received sideband privileges in the 28.3 to 28.5 MHz segment of 10 meters. And in a final act of technician liberation, in 1991, 40 years after the license was established, the code-free technician was created. So, if you meet a technician who has been licensed since the 1960s, treat him or her with dignity and respect, for they have suffered and endured years of being ostracized so that today's technicians can enjoy full VHF and UHF privileges. In our next installment, we will look at the development of repeaters and repeater regulations. I hope you will join me. The Recording Academy announcing its Special Merit Awards recipients has said the Audio Engineering Society is to receive a Technical Grammy Award during its Grammy Week celebration this February. Special Merit Awards are presented to individuals and or companies, organizations, and institutions who have made contributions of outstanding technical significance to the recording field. In receiving this award, the Audio Engineering Society joins an elite list of previous recipients, which includes well-known names such as Apple Computer, JBL Professional, Shure, Sony, and Philips, among others. The Audio Engineering Society is the only professional society devoted exclusively to advancing audio technology. 
founded in 1948 with the key goals of collecting, collating, and disseminating knowledge of audio science and its application, AES facilitates communication and collaboration that unites audio engineers, creative artists, scientists, and students with hundreds of local sections worldwide. 75 years on, AES's members continue to set precedents and standards wherever sound and technology meet, from recording, radio broadcasting, and entertainment to scientific research in emerging fields such as spatial and game audio, networking and streaming, and audio for virtual and augmented reality. Foundations of Amateur Radio it's an immersive effort to create an article every week, so much so that I've only just discovered that I passed the 600 article mark some time ago. I'd open up a bottle of something celebratory if I thought it warranted the effort, but I'd rather talk about amateur radio, and what I've learned since becoming licensed in December of 2010. This hobby, this community, the activity of amateur radio keeps surprising me in unexpected and exciting ways. I know that there is part of the community that thinks of this as a dying hobby, but with every fibre in my being I know this to be wrong. We explore, test, build and learn at every opportunity. Put any two amateurs in contact with each other, either physically or over the air, and you'll soon witness an exchange of ideas, of things that bring joy, hints of the next thing and the next. The inspiration for my writing comes from all manner of places. For example, here's an opinion recently shared by someone on social media. Basic antenna modelling using software should be included in ham radio licensing exam syllabus if it's not currently. As opinions go, it's one of the tamer ones I've come across, but it's not unique in any sense of the word. I've heard it described bemoaning the missing knowledge of new digital modes, or the need to upgrade my licence, or the idea that the introductory licence should come with a fixed expiry date. You might have heard similar ones phrased along the lines of a missing attribute that new licensees should be required to learn or know about before they can call themselves amateurs. It's also completely unhelpful. Let me explain why. I'll start with an analogy. When was the last time your driver's license expired because you didn't upgrade it due to new road rules, new vehicle types, new car accessories or speed limits? In case you're confused, the answer is never. Does amateur radio cause death and mayhem in the community? No. Do cars? So, in the scheme of things, even if amateur radio can be used to help save lives, it's not an activity that's generally considered life-threatening. You could argue that radio amateurs could cause life-threatening interference, and technically they can. So can any user of any piece of radio equipment, CB radio, mobile phone, Wi-Fi, you name it. Even a half-asleep electronic student in their first year of high school could do this. The skill isn't specific to radio amateurs. So what is this about, the requirement for antenna modelling or some other missing skill, and why does our community keep getting flooded with such, frankly, nonsense? In my opinion, it's the same phenomenon that laments the loss of Morse code, the fact that we lost the 11 metre band, that we are playing with FT8 instead of AM, that we prefer integrated circuits to valves. The world is a flowing feast, and amateur radio is along for the ride. Stand still and the world moves on. Should amateur radio licensing change? Absolutely. It should move with the times. It should lower the barrier to entry at every opportunity. It should explore the possible, not the requirements of a select group of people who decry the dumbing down of the hobby and want to preload every license exam with things that are absolutely irrelevant to the turning on of a radio and making noise. Will amateurs benefit from knowing that antenna modelling software exists? Sure they will, just like they'll benefit from knowing about valves and Morse code. That doesn't mean that they should be part of the exam process. I want new amateurs, no, all amateurs, to be curious, to ask, to discover, to explore, and to want to know stuff. Not because it's a requirement to get a license, but because it's beneficial to their amateur journey. Every week I come up with a different way to look at our hobby, because this hobby is so diverse. I've used the phrase a thousand hobbies in one. So far I've just scratched the surface some 600 weeks in. We'll see where we're at when I've held my license for another decade or so. So, have at it. What is missing from the current exam and why should it be included? I'm on it. Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. The National Science Foundation has reached an agreement with SpaceX 
To mitigate the effects of the company's second-generation Starlink satellites on astronomy, even as another organization goes to court to block the constellation's deployment. The National Science Foundation, which funds operations of several major observatories, announced January 10th that it had completed an astronomy coordination agreement with SpaceX regarding its Gen 2 Starlink constellation. The Federal Communications Commission granted a license December 2, 2022 to allow SpaceX to deploy a quarter of that 30,000 satellite system while deferring consideration of the rest of the constellation. That coordination agreement was a condition of the Gen 2 FCC license. The Georgia State Parks on the Air will be held April 1st and 2nd of 2023. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more. ARRL member Claude Ray, AC4SH, said this is the first time that all of Georgia's 50 state parks have been involved. The objective is to encourage ham radio operators to visit Georgia state parks and experience the fun of parks on the air activation, said Ray. This is a fun contest only. The rules are minimal, the scoring is simple, and the main award is to simply have the fun of getting on the air. The entire process is largely based on the honor system, although logs of the top activators will be cross-checked. The contest period begins at 0800 Eastern Daylight Time, April 1st, 2023, through 2000 hours Eastern Daylight Time, April 2nd, 2023, and operating hours are subject to park rules and times. Every station participating in the event and submitting a log will, upon request, receive a certificate of participation, indicating the number of parks that have been contacted. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Participants with the top three scores in each of five categories will receive a certificate indicating the award. Georgia Activator Individual, Georgia Activator Club, In Georgia Hunter Individual or Club, Out of State Hunter Individual or Club, and Georgia Aries Club. Each station participating in the event and submitting a log will, upon request, receive a certificate of participation indicating the number of parks contacted. Ray added there's 47 parks who already have at least one hand planning to act activate on April 1st and 2nd weekend. You can access the complete rules at gaparks.org slash rules. A record number of pilgrims turned out this year for the largest religious pilgrimage in India. The Ganga Sagar Mela and the West Bengal Radio Club were there, as always, to assist with public safety, communications, and coordination for individuals who fell ill and needed airlifting from the island to area hospitals. More than a dozen people were reported missing at the massive gathering, and the hams assisted in reuniting them with their families on the island. Officials told the Hindu newspaper that they had the support of about 42 amateur radio operators. The Mela began on the 5th of January and ended on the 17th. While they were there, the hams were also able to make contacts as part of the islands on the air from the island which is in the Bay of Bengal and has the designation of AS-153. They use the call sign AT2WBRC. The Dave Catler Memorial Youth DX Adventure Group is returning to Curacao this year and is inviting young amateurs to be part of the operation. The application period is now open. The trip will take place between July 13th and July 18th, 2023, with the goal of forming a DX team of amateurs between the ages of 12 and 17. This year, the timing of the trip has an added bonus. Because this year's DX adventure overlaps somewhat with the Youth on the Air camp taking place in Canada in July, the young hams in Curacao can expect to have some scheduled contacts with the Youth on the Air campers as well. The PJ2T site in Curacao will once again be the location for the Caribbean activation. According to the Youth DX Adventure website, the team is applying to once again use the call sign PJ2Y. According to QRZ.com, Two amateurs in the Indian radio community have become silent keys. S. Venkataraman, VU2SV, was described in many online tributes as a homebrew legend. People posting their condolences in a number of online forums expressed their gratitude for the assistance he gave them in many of their own projects and for serving as an inspiration. A ham since 1962, he passed on January 3rd at the age of 88. Amateurs in India and Sri Lanka were also grieving the loss. 
of Sun Shamugasundram, VU2 FOT. A well known amateur, he was part of the team that created a popular Sunday morning net in 1988. In the beginning, it was known as the Shortwave Listening DX Net, but on its 10th anniversary, was renamed the BC DX Net, a name that continues to this day. Sun passed on January 12th at the age of 61. Bruce Page, KK5DO, has filed his weekly AMSAT report. And did you know you are now able to earn worked all zones on satellite? The current FM satellites for the U.S. only allow you to work about 16 CQ zones. Jump on IO117 Digital and you can work the others. Hector, W5CBF, earned WAZ satellite number 42 exactly doing that. This also means that you are able to earn DXCC on satellite by augmenting your contacts with some digital ones. This week, Paul, N8HM, worked the linear transponder on F0118, which has a 15-meter uplink and a 70-centimeter down link he used an FT817ND to an Alex Loop Walkham portable magnetic loop with only 5 watts. Sounds like a very nice portable station for that satellite. Remember, the satellite also has an FM transponder. And January 24th is the second anniversary of the UVSQ sat. The FM transponder will be turned on with no PL tone, 145.905 MHz for the uplink and 437.020 MHz for the downlink. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that last week's bulletin opened with, wow. Tad says he doesn't know what to say about this week, except it's beyond wow. Average daily sunspot numbers rose from 135.9 to 173.4, while the average solar flux went from 221.8 to 181.2. Spaceweather.com is saying that if sunspot production continues at this pace for the rest of January, the monthly sunspot number will reach a 20-year high. The average planetary A index increased from 6.7 to 13.9. On January 15th, the planetary A index reached a peak of 30, a very high value indicating a geomagnetic storm. Conditions were stormy throughout the week due to flares and coronal mass ejections. On that day in Fairbanks, Alaska, the College A index was 53. There was a large polar cap absorption event. Nine new sunspot groups appeared during this reporting week, January 12th through the 18th. One appeared on January 12th, four on January 13th, two more on the 15th, and two more, one each, on January 17th and 18th. So let's take a look at the predicted solar flux, which is 215, 212, and 210 on January 21st through the 23rd, 206 on January 24th and 25th, 200 and 190 on January 26th and 27th respectively, 185 on January 28th and 29th, 190 on January 30th all the way through February 2nd. Looking at the predicted planetary A index now, it will be 16, 12, and 8 on January 21st through the 23rd, 5 on January 24th and 25th, 8, 12, and 8 on January 26th through the 28th, 5 on January 29th through the 31st, 12, and 8 on February 1st through the 2nd. In radio sport contesting this week, and January 19th through the 20th, it's the Walk for the Bacon QRP contest, that's CW. January 20th through the 22nd, the Hungarian DX contest, that's CW and phone. January 21st and 22nd as well, the Pro Digi contest, that's digital. On January 21st, the RSGB AFS contest, that's phone. January 21st and the 22nd, the North American QSO party, that's phone as well. And on January 21st and the 22nd, the NA Collegian Championship, that is phone too. January 21st and 23rd is, of course, the ARRL January VHF contest. And the year-long ARRL volunteers on the air, VOTA, continues. Some upcoming section, state, and division conventions you want to be aware of. On January 20th through the 21st, it's the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Section Convention. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. January 20th through the 21st as well, the Cowtown Ham Fest hosting the ARRL North Texas Section Convention. That's in Forest Hill, Texas. January 27th and 28th, the Capital City Ham Fest 2003, hosting the ARRL Mississippi State Convention. That's in Jackson, Mississippi. And January 28th, it's Winterfest, hosting the ARRL Midwest Division Convention. That's in Collinsville, Illinois. 
Administrators from Parks on the Air have spent the past few days tallying up activator totals for 2022. Here is Matt here, N3NWV from Parks on the Air with all of the details. Howdy, POTA folks. I'm Matt, N3NWV, and this is the December 22 monthly POTA update, which is our 2022 year-end wrap-up. So instead of December statistics, let's talk about how 2022 stacked up against 2021. In terms of total activations, there were 141,477. That's a 195% increase over the previous year. 7,187 activators participated in these activations, which is a 171% increase over 2021. In total, 14,818 parks were activated, a 134% increase over 2021. These parks are spread out across 72 DXCC entities, 147% increase over 2021. And drum roll, please. We logged over 6.26 million QSOs in 2022. That's a 220% increase, more than double what we logged in 2021. And as you might expect with the maturity of the POTA program, a lot of the growth is happening outside of the United States. In IARU Region 1, we had 5,940 activators. That's a 418% increase over 2021, four times as many activators in Region 1. Mike Zero, Oscar, Victor, Golf was the most active activator with 257 activations. And Echo Alpha 2, Echo Zulu topped the QSO list with just shy of 46,000 total contacts. Fantastic numbers for Region 2 outside of the continental U.S. as well. 11,630 activations represents a 267% increase over 2021. The gold stars go to Hotel India 8 Delta with 973 activations. Pretty impressive. And Victor Echo 3 Tango Hotel Romeo with just over 37,000 total QSOs. Last but by no means least, Region 3's 8,780 QSOs represents a 283% increase over 2021. Juliet Fox 7, Romeo Juliet Mike made a clean sweep of both activations and QSOs with 468 and 21,700 respectively. Now those are some fantastic numbers any way you slice it, but where does it leave POTA the program as a whole? Well, as of January 8th, 2023, when this is being recorded, the POTA program is just a couple shy of 32,000 registered users. There are slightly more than 37,000 total park entities defined in the database. There are 81 DXCC entities with parks defined, and all 81 of them have at least one activation logged. 17,600 parks have been activated at least once. There are 8,930 unique call signs in the list of activators. There are more than 343,000 unique call signs listed as hunters in the QSO table, and that QSO table lists 11.3 million total POTA contacts. There are obviously a whole lot of people who are active in POTA. We thank each and every one of you. You all are the key to making this work and making it enjoyable for everybody. There are, however, a select few whose dedication to POTA goes above and beyond what most of us are able to pull off. And those are the winners of our Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge. By the end of 2022, 24 were left standing in the hunter category for the Bailey Sprott Park-A-Day Challenge. Collectively, these 24 operators accumulated well over 100,000 QSOs, and each and every one of them worked over 1,000 parks. Very well done to all 24 who completed the challenge in the hunter category, and thanks for your dedication to sitting in front of that radio all 365 days. And finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, we have six, yeah, count them six, survivors of the activator version of the Bailey Sprott Challenge. These six intrepid individuals managed to get out there and do a POTA activation all 365 days of calendar year 2022. Those six are Kilo 4, November, Yankee, Mike, Bill, Kilo Bravo 3, Whiskey, Alpha, Victor, Carrie, Kilo Delta 4, Mike, Zulu, Mike, Eric, Kilo Echo 8, Papa, Zulu, November, James, November 2, November, Whiskey, Kilo, Dell, and Whiskey, Charlie, 1, November, Robert. 
If you hunt parks on the air, the odds are that you've worked one, if not all six of these activators. To call them pillars of the POTA community would be the understatement of 2022. Thank you and well done to all six of these truly first class operators. Judging by the database, they're at it again in 2023. So good luck there too. So that'll put a wrap on our wrap up of 2022. Thanks one and all for your participation and help with the POTA program. A happy new year and best of luck in 2023. The fourth annual KFF Marathon Challenge kicked off on the 1st of January, encouraging participants in the Worldwide Flora and Fauna Awards Program to strive for their best scores once again this year, either as activators or hunters. KFF is the designation of the Worldwide Flora and Fauna Program for activation sites within the United States and its territories. Awards are available for the top North American hunters, top DX hunters, and top activators. Some of the more interesting sites include the Hawaiian Islands National Wildlife Refuge, the Guam National Wildlife Refuge, Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska, and Choctaw National Wildlife Refuge in Puerto Rico. Other parks, islands, caverns, and protected areas are located throughout the United States mainland. For details, visit the Worldwide Flora and Fauna KFF on the web. The Federal Emergency Management Agency released the 2022 National Preparedness Report, revealing the impacts that climate change and associated natural disasters continue to have on emergency management capabilities and communities across the country. The report focuses on the nation's changing risk environment, driven by climate change, physical and technological vulnerabilities, and inequity. Preparedness indicators and measurements of national capability levels, and management opportunities that can assist communities in managing risks and addressing capability gaps. The report, available as a PDF at the FEMA website, identifies the challenges that emergency managers face in addressing a changing risk environment, and how they can meet those challenges to help achieve a more prepared nation. Emergency managers and whole community partners, including the ARRL ARIES program across the nation, can look to this year's report to help support decisions about program priorities, resource allocations, and community actions. Again, the report is available as a PDF on the FEMA website. Did you know that one of the benefits of being an ARRL affiliated club is having access to the club commission program? Affiliated clubs can use this program to receive a commission for promoting membership in ARRL. When you sign a new member, the club gets $15, and when a member renews through the club, you get $5. Members can renew any time without losing any of their membership time. Details and forms are available on the ARRL website at www.arrl.org forward slash affiliated hyphen club hyphen benefits. FAQs are also available to help explain the program. It does take some effort and a bit of paperwork, but the club reaps the rewards in cash. If your affiliated club is not participating in the program, ask them to investigate it. And finally this week, to wrap up our 23rd year, if you've ever wanted to work for NASA, here's your chance. Well, don't expect a paycheck or any benefits, but the agency is looking for volunteers to help process the huge amount of exoplanet data with their exoplanet watch program. If you have a telescope, you can even contribute data to the project. But if your telescope's in the back closet, you can process data they've collected over the years. You might think the only way to contribute with a telescope is to have a mini observatory in your backyard, but that's not the case. According to NASA, even a 6-inch telescope can detect hundreds of exoplanet transits using their software. You might not get paid, but the program's policy requires that the first paper to use work done by program volunteers will receive co-author credit on the paper. Not too shabby. The observations involve measuring dips in star brightness caused by the transit of a known exoplanet. This allows the planet's orbit to be calculated more precisely, which helps other scientists who want to observe the planet later. This can save valuable time on large instruments by tasking the telescope for the exact time the exoplanet will transit. We find it ironic that it wasn't so long ago that science generally dismissed the possibility of detecting and observing extrasolar planets. Now there are more than 5,000 of them known to exist. That's a thousand a year for Enterprise's five-year mission. We love citizen science, especially when it's space-based. 
There are several other projects on Zooniverse if you want a choice between space and other kinds of science. Check it out on Zooniverse.org. That's Z-O-O-N-I-V-E-R-S-E dot org. We hope you'll be with us next week for the beginning of our 24th year of service to the amateur radio community. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Rich on Tech Podcast, courtesy of Premier Networks, the International Telecommunications Union, the 425DX News, Parks on the Air, and the Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you...